All right, everyone, thank you for joining. Um, we'll get started shortly. We're just waiting for a couple more people to join and then we'll get going. All right, so let's get started today. Welcome to Activist Investing with Mr. Nelson Peltz. Um, this is a Street Fins guest speaker event, and uh, let's get started right now. So before we dive in, um, just a bit about Street Fins. Street Fins is an organization that's dedicated to solving financial literacy, illiteracy, right? So we're basically in the business of teaching high schoolers all about finance so that they can make good decisions and you know lead a good life with uh, sound financial advice. Check us out at streetfins.com. That's our main website. Um, add streetfins on Instagram, streetfins on Facebook, pretty much whatever social media you can think of, search up streetfins and we'll be there. Um, if you want to check us out on Spotify, Apple Music, wherever you listen to your online uh, media streaming, head over and search up Finance Simplified Podcasts and you'll be able to listen to the Streetfins podcast that's hosted by our founder, Rohan Gupta. So make sure to check all of that out and um, also, please join our Discord at uh, tinyurl.com slash streetfinsclubconnect. That's where you will get all the um, you know, updates and information about other events just like this one. So without further ado, um, let's get started. Um, so my name is Rahul. I'll be going through today's um, event. And we're here with Mr. Peltz. So hi, Mr. Peltz. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Nelson Peltz. My dad was Mr. Peltz, so you can call me Nelson Raul. And I'm thrilled to be here. I wish I could be there in person, but COVID doesn't allow for that. Yep, um, we're just going to have to make do with uh, this, but it's still great, right? Everybody's able to join us. So let's start off with just talking about your career path, right? So how did you get to the place that you are right now? Well, it was a little circuitous. It wasn't direct. Uh, I went to Wharton and uh, really it was a silly choice on my part because I was there for a year or two and found the courses very boring. I didn't know when I was ever going to use finance and, and accounting and economics. So I left and uh, to my parents' chagrin and uh, followed my first love and that was being a ski bum and I went up to Maine and that's what I did I waited tables and washed dishes and uh, got to ski every day and life was great and I thought I'd be doing that forever but I didn't plan ahead and the snow melted at the end of April and uh, I needed to do something I was fortunate to get a job offered out in Mount Hood, Oregon starting late in the midsummer, and I needed some gas money to get out there. So I went to my dad, who was a great guy, and he had a small family business selling food to hotels and restaurants in New York City. And I asked him for a job on a truck, and he gave it to me and made me shave my beard. But other than that, he was very cooperative. And uh, after a couple of weeks, I told him I thought there were a lot of opportunities that he wasn't taking advantage of. And he said, why don't you stay and do it instead of going out to Mount Hood, Oregon? And that's what I did. So I'd still been work. I started working there as a temporary employee and uh, got very into business, very excited about it. And we built that $2 million a year business into $150 million a year business uh, back in the 70s. And we were the largest food service distributor at the time in the Northeast. And that's sort of how I got my my start in business. I took it public and uh, it was a great experience for me. Yeah, that sounds like uh, quite the journey, right? From skiing out in the mountains to one of the most successful companies um, 
you know, in your industry. So along this pretty interesting path, what were some of the most important lessons that you learned along the way? Well, I'll tell you, if you come to our office and you have a cup of coffee on every mug, it says on one side, cash is king, and on the other side, sales up, expenses down. I learned that from my dad, and once I learned that, I really didn't need to go finish Wharton. He also explained to me that keeping business simple and I learned very quickly, complexity really gums up the works. It screws up profit margins, and it really impacts corporate, corporate cultures. So out of all of that, what do you uh, know today that you kind of wish you knew when you first started off in the business world? I, I wish I was a little bit more patient something that I learned as I got older. I realized how much time I have. When I was in my 20s, I didn't think I had a lot of time, but uh, here I am well into my 70s and figure I got I got time to get it done and, and, and let things evolve, give people a chance to understand what you're trying to explain to them and making sure that you have a culture in any company you're involved in. And it's very important that there's a culture of accountability. And with that culture, you really wind up having success. And if the culture is wrong, it just isn't gonna work. All right, so slow and steady wins the race, basically. Patience is key. And so, um, now let's kind of shift towards today's topic. Uh, can you kind of explain what exactly activist investing is and how it's kind of different from just normal investing? I was going to ask you the same question. I, I think that uh, what we do is, you can call it activism, uh, but what we do is we buy stock in a company that we think at one point in time was a great company, no longer is, but it's got the potential to be that. And most importantly, we have a plan to bring it back to greatness. And I think uh, we've been doing that with we, before we ever had a fund. We did that in the 80s and we built the largest packaging company in the world by buying companies, fixing them up, and making them run better. And we created American National Can. Uh, and then we did that again when we bought Snapple from Quaker Oats. And that was a business we thought Snapple was a great brand, but Quaker didn't quite know how to run it. And we felt that we could do a better job and we bought it uh, when it was losing money and sales were declining double digits. And when we sold it to Cadbury, it was doing the opposite. It was growing double digits and, and it was quite profitable. So we, we, we sort of look at things very basically and say, what can we do differently to make this company great? And my, I think our most recent success we had uh, was P&G, which was fundamentally and is fundamentally a fantastic company. We had a proxy fight with them and, and we had a disagreement on structure. And at the end of the day, we got our board seat and they brought in McKinsey to be the arbiter of whether our structure was right, their structure was right, was there a, another structure that was right? And to their credit, both P&G's credit and McKinsey, they came up with a structure that was very much akin to ours and it had real accountability. And as a result, P&G today 
same people managing brands, but it's a company that's growing beautifully, taking market share as opposed to giving it. And when I got on the board, the stock was 75. And before the recent downturn, it was in the high 140s. Now it's, I don't know where it is, 125, 130, still quite good. And But more importantly, the company continues to do well. So it wasn't a matter of leveraging up the company, putting on a lot of debt, breaking up the company, firing a ton of people. It was really creating real accountability on behalf of the managers, reducing corporate overhead, and giving these people the ability to run their business, run their brands, and have full, again, responsibility or accountability from sales down to EBIT. And that's what we do, and that's what we did at Heinz, and we've done this so many times, and it does work. So basically, in you know, really simplified language, you're basically buying a big enough portion of a company so that you can kind of go in and, you know, change the the direction that it's heading in. And then you kind of flip it and make it into a good company again. Uh, You know, with very big companies, we can't buy a lot. I mean, today P and G's market cap is north of 300 billion. When I got there, it was uh, probably a bit shy of 200 billion. So, we weren't, we bought, you know, about three and a half billion dollars worth of stock, but that wasn't enough to rock the boat. What it was, was discussing our plan, putting out a white paper, trying to get management to buy in. And, and when they, we had a disagreement, you know, we went to share owners and share owners, uh, voted and, uh, that's what happened. So uh, I got my board seat and the board has been very welcoming and the company's doing great things. All right. Sounds super interesting. So this time your company focus on specific industries or, you know, is it just kind of identifying these struggling companies in any part of the market? Uh, We specialize in everything consumer. That's obviously consumer, restaurants, retail, although we're not doing too much retail right now. What we call financials without balance sheets. For example, we're very large share owners today in Vesco on the board there, been at Leg Mason, been at Bank of New York, Mellon, before that, uh, and industrials. So those are the three categories we feel most comfortable in. It's in those categories that we, some of the founding partners, ran businesses as CEO, COO in those industries and felt very comfortable in them. And we continue to own our skills to make sure that we're up to date and know what we're doing. And It takes us a very long time to decide to invest in a company. And we, at this point in time, probably have only about eight investments. So to make it into our list is a very exclusive group. And we've done a huge amount of work, sometimes over a year's worth of work, to put together a plan that we think is very special to bring that company back to its prior glory. So you talked about how it takes a long time and it's really hard to pick these brands. So what is the due diligence process like for selecting a company? Look, it takes a long time for us to do our work from the outside because we don't have access to the books and records of a company. It's not like private equity comes in and they open up everything. They don't know we're there. That's the goal. Our goal is to buy our stock, not to 
let them know we're there because otherwise the stock, we're not going to buy it as cheaply as we can. And then once we bought our position, we make no announcements. We meet with management and the board, take them to our plan, which is our white paper. If they agree with it, then our white paper never sees the light of the day. If they don't, then we put the white paper out and we press hard for a board seat. And uh, if then they don't give it to us, then uh, we wind up, you know, letting shareholders decide. And uh, all of our proxy battles wound up to be very friendly when it was all over and uh, great success. Okay, so we talked about board seats for a little bit. So why does Tryon need these board seats and how exactly do they go about it? Um, you know, what's the process of getting these seats? Well, we need board seats so we can be inside the room and making sure that the company understands what it is we expect. Let me tell you, when you're on a board today, you're a single practitioner and you're dealing with sometimes thousands of pages worth of stuff. You have board minutes from the previous board meetings. You've got proposals. You've got financials. You've got committee that you're on probably two committees and you have all the minutes plus the proposals of that, those two committees. So it's a lot of work. Now we have uniquely, when we get on a board, we sign a confidentiality agreement. And so the portfolio manager and the lawyers and the few people in our shop who are responsible for that investment really get into all that work. So when we go to a board meeting, we are well prepared. And I got to tell you, that's not always the case because if a director, if an independent director may be on two or three boards, sometimes four, that's a lot of reading to do for five or six meetings a year or maybe more. And you're doing that on your own where we have a staff of people, so we're very well prepared. We're also in touch with management in between meetings, probably once a week, talking to them. Our, our guys are talking to their people, or I'm talking, if I'm on that board, to the CEO. And as a result, they we don't wait for the board meeting to, to try and put out our, our our opinion, our plan forth. We try and do that outside the room. So when we get in the room, we are all on the same page and that works much more than 90% of the time. All right. And so uh, the next question we have here is, uh, you briefly mentioned proxy contests. So I don't think a lot of people know exactly what those are. So what are proxy contests and how often does try and undertake these campaigns? A proxy contest is the same as a presidential election. Okay. Uh, there might be in a typical company, 12 board seats come up for real for election every year. We'd like to have one of those board seats. Most cases, the companies offer us a board seat if we ask, because I think our reputation and our stock ownership uh, precedes us in that case. And they're over a period of time, they've been happy to have us on board because the companies have done better once we get on the board, but in the rare case where they want, they want to fight, we then take our plan to the shareholders and ask them to vote for us. So in many cases, we've had, in three cases, we've had proxy fights. 
got our board seats, and the rest was history. Okay, so I, I think the election was a pretty good way to kind of, you know, give something that people can relate to. So can you describe your most recent proxy contest at PNG and, you know, what has happened since then? PNG was the biggest proxy fight ever. Uh, we, we got our board seat. After we got our board seat, we worked and to give credit to the board of PNG and the chairman, we worked very amicably with them. We got in the boardroom, we presented our plan. As I told you, they hired McKinsey. We came away from those meetings with a plan for the company to go forward. And I'll explain to you, prior to our investing in P&G, there were 11,000 people in corporate ex research and development. And the way the company was structured, it was structured with brand managers who were very capable, but no one had p &L responsibility. That's profit and loss responsibility other than the CEO. Today, the company is run at as seven different profit centers with a CEO in each. And that CEO is responsible from sales and market shares all the way down to EBIT, its earnings before interest and taxes. Above those seven people are no longer 11,000 people, but 4,000 people. Our goal was to get to 1,000. And those 4,000 people are the corporate employees. But now when the company, when the CEO is running the business, he has seven direct reports and he judges how they're doing, not just by sales and market share, but from sales to profit and market share. And the company is a better company today because managers are know what they are asked to do. They're asked to grow their business. They're asked also to make a profit. And they have full responsibility for that, from marketing on through purchasing everything else. So it's the company has evolved. Same thing at Heinz, which was our first proxy fight. When we got to Heinz, Heinz for 10 years, sales and profits, had been flattened down. We had our pro we had our proxy fight. One of the things we were complaining about was that Heinz was not spending enough money on direct marketing, whether it was television or the internet. They weren't spending enough money, and they were giving discounts to get on different shelves, to top sh the eye level shelf instead of the shoe level shelf. But the, their marketing spend had gone down to about a point and a half of sales, which is way too low. Our plan was to raise that number and get that marketing spend up, stop giving so much in discounts and allowances, which at first we said the customers might not like it, but over a period of time, they would because they were able to make more of a full price, a full margin on their sales. So we had the proxy fight, we won, we got two board seats. The company did institute our plan. We, we reduced our market, we reduced our discounts and allowances. We increased our direct market spend. In fact, our market spend direct marketing were tripled over a period of the time that I was on the board. And as a result, we had 32 straight quarters of increasing sales and profits. 
and there wasn't a consumer company around, certainly not a food company around, that could make that statement for 32 straight quarters, where prior to that, the company didn't have very many, if any, straight quarters of increasing sales, market share, and profits. So I'm very proud of those results. Sometimes they, you got to take a hard role to, to get them, the company to do what you, they need to do. But once it's done, it's a better company. All right, uh, that's all good. So now let's talk about this. <laughs> Let's talk about ESG investing. Uh, do you consider Tryon as an ESG investor? And how have you worked with your portfolio companies to improve ESG? Oh, yeah. Look, we've been doing ESG before ESG was a, an issue. In the 80s, the 80s, people didn't even know what ESG was. We were the largest recycling company in the world. We recycled don't hold me to it, 80 odd, almost 90% of all the beverage cans we sold around the world, certainly in US and in Europe, not as much in Asia. Probably about 50% of the steel cans and the glass bottles we sold were, you know, they, they, they are very, we recycled many of those and if they didn't recycle, they recycled themselves. So the products we were we were making, we made plastic, but we sold that division. And uh, we created a system where it was beneficial for people to recycle. Today, you walk around, you don't see a lot of beverage cans and beverage bottles on the street. You see other things. And, and need created that. Not only our desire to do the right thing, but need. When we bought National Can and then American Can and put them together, deposits on cans and bottles were five cents and probably were planning to go higher because they were not being recycled. If they went higher, that would re retard sales because if you're paying a dime, for a, a can of Coke that was a deposit that would you would buy a little less Coke. So as a result, we started these recycling programs for our benefit and the benefit of our world that we live in, and it worked. And deposits today still remain in five cents, and you see a whole infrastructure of people with bags and carts of cans and bottles, bringing them to recycling centers, many of which we originally built way back when. And that's what happens. Now, we have got to create, and we're doing a lot of work at, at P&G to recreate recyclable plastic. We have that. People have got to be incentivized to bring them to these recycling centers so they can be sorted and put back into plastic. I'm very proud of a product product line that we're, we're marketing today just on the internet, but ultimately it will be broad when our factories are done at P&G and it covers shampoo and conditioner and hand wash and face wash and bath wash and dish wash. And it's a phenomenal technology. It's a square that's about twice the size average of a postage stamp. It comes in either a, a cardboard box or a bamboo box. And you take one of these squares into the shower and you wet it and you rub it in your hair and you've got a head full of shampoo more than you'd like. But when you're done, there's no plastic bottle. It's portion control. And when that, when that box of shampoo or conditioner or 
dishwasher or whatever it is, is, is done, there is nothing left except a paper or bamboo box that is totally recyclable as opposed to what you have today. Now, P&G spent well over 10 years, maybe 17 years developing this. I got on the technology committee. When I saw it, I was so excited. I begged them to put it out. Our two factories will be coming online uh, mid-summer to make this product. And you'll see it initially in Tide, and you'll see it in a lot of the shampoos and conditioners, et cetera, that we make. In terms of, in terms of uh, S or G, in 1970, I went public with my first company in 1971. My first CFO was a woman. Well, that doesn't sound like a big deal today. But let me tell you something of companies back in 1970, you just didn't see women CFOs. I had a great one. People, some investment banking firms looked a little askance at me. You have a woman CFO. Today, you it's hard for you guys to fathom that, but it was true. And she was great. And we would argue, she and I would like cats and dogs at times, but we debate things, but she was terrific. And I was proud to have a woman CFO. I had a woman sales manager. Again, that doesn't sound like a big deal today, but it was in 1970 and 1971. In governance, we don't believe any company should have anything but one share, one vote. So I think we've done our part. We lived it. We breathed it. Any companies that had it way back when we got rid of it, they were involved with one company that doesn't have one share, one vote, but management owns so much of it. And they have a special committee of directors who represent only the independent voters. But for the most part, it's one share, one vote. Uh, for anyone that was confused, I think um, what Nelson just explained kind of showed to everyone what ESG is, right? It's doing good for the environment, um, being fair and equal to everyone, and also just having corporate governance. So um, clearly, you guys have been ahead of the curve for most of it. So we've talked a lot about your successes, but I'm sure there have also been some failures. So what have uh, some of these failures been and what have you learned from them? Uh, my, my biggest failure was in 1989-90, I made an investment in the UK of a company that had very valuable property and my goal was to liquidate those buildings and that real estate and turn that into a cash pool to make investments or buy companies and list it on the and it was listed on the LSE unfortunately the first gulf war broke out and all property sales stopped and stopped for a good period of time. And as a result, I lost money on that transaction. Anything after that, I did, you know, small potatoes. But that one taught me that you cannot know everything. Okay, you can do all your work and we do so much work. But there was no way I knew that we would have the first Gulf War break out. So I could have put the balance sheet in better shape. I could have done a lot of that. So you will see the companies that we operate with today having more cash, 
than perhaps is necessary. But we are creatures of our of of our experiences, and that was one that stuck with me. And uh, I don't ever want to be in that position again. Yeah, so obviously stuff like that you can't predict. And uh, moving on to our next topic is actually about one of the most unpredictable events, you know, COVID-19. So how have your portfolio companies been impacted? And, um, you know, how have you adjusted to the impacts of the pandemic? You know, some of the companies have been impacted very, with, very severely. Cisco, that's with an S. A great company, but their their customers are restaurants, hotels, airlines, steamships, schools, nursing homes, not places that people are eating at today. Okay, so that customer group has been hard pressed. On the other hand, at Wendy's, which you might have thought would have been hurt by COVID, even though we had lots of dining rooms closed, our drive through and our delivery business prospered. And we had lesser, smaller number of orders, but way bigger. And as a result, the business sailed through beautifully. Mondelez continued to do well. Mondelez sells, you know, Oreo and uh, milk and chocolate, and Cadbury chocolate, uh, some delicious things like Hates cookies. Uh, that was unscathed, as was p and G. I I mean, a couple of products on P&G didn't do well, like beauty, because women were spending less time spending time on their beauty. On the other hand, and shaving, men would shave less. But on the other hand, paper towels or, or disinfectants or, or toilet paper, things like that were being hoarded. So on balance, COVID was a positive for them. So those are the some of the impacts. Each company has got a different story, but for the most part, they're, they're coming through it beautifully. Cisco is still making money, even though its customer base has been really hurt, but we see it coming back. And I think what we've learned to do is we've learned to be more, more efficient, use this time to reduce costs. And with that customer base being shrinking to, in certain cases, to zero, the company continues to make money, albeit less than what it was. It's a testament to the management there that we have. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, you know, it's a good story. So, you know, um, I know that you like philanthropy a lot. So, what are some, um, you know, philanthropic projects that you're very passionate about? But besides schools and colleges and things like and hospitals that and I'm involved with a fair number of all of those. I've had a very long relationship as chairman or vice chairman of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. And and our tools for tolerance program. And our and our country needs more of that. You know. People don't realize this, but the Rodney King episode that some of you may have read about, where an African American man was beaten up by some police in LA in 1992, we created Tools for Tolerance program that was meant to, and we had close to 150,000 law enforcement professionals from around the country and a few, few around the country and some other countries 
in order to address and confront these issues, which include racial profiling, a very hot topic today. But think of that, we started to really get into it and create, and I spent a lot of time and donations on this to make people aware of those issues, hate crimes, understanding what cultural diversity means, uh, bias-based policing and leadership initiatives to build community trust. Now, clearly, I say to the people we failed, they tell me that we haven't failed as we've had, we have a program as we've had, as I said, about 150,000 over the years, law enforcement professionals come through our educational program. They tell me it could have been worse. I would certainly hope it could have been better, but we continue to strive that we have teachers come through, we have judges come through, uh, but, and we, we check with the participants afterward to see if they felt that the programs really help them and they and, and we have a statistic that says over 90 percent of them who've attended and this is not just a quick online course this is something where it takes a few days to go through that they can attest the value of the positive impact that that has had on them and their career so we're doing what we can. Can we do more? Yes. And we've got to continue to do more. You know, Black Lives Matter, they do. All Lives Matter. I know you're not supposed to say that, but I, I mean that. When you saw the the people who invaded the Capitol, it troubled me that there were people walking around the Capitol building with t-shirts that read Camp Auschwitz on it. Auschwitz was an internment camp, a death camp in World War II, uh, meant primarily for Jews. So all of these things mean a lot to me and, and I hope we all every day can be a bit more aware that whatever we think we're doing and doing the right way, we can do better and we need to do better because this is still a great country. Capitalism is still a great way to run a country, but it is far from perfect. And we have to strive every day to get it closer to perfect and strive every day to make it better and better. And I know that I try and do that. And if everybody tried to do that, we would solve a hell of a lot of problems we're facing. Yeah, definitely. Everybody can try to chip in in their own part to solve these problems. So, you know, our last question here before we head into the audience Q&A is, do you have any advice for uh, beginner investors, right? Most of our audience here today are just getting started in their investing or are at the very beginning, right? So uh, what advice would you give them, um, you know, either just based on your experiences or general knowledge? What I would give them is to really, whether they make money on a stock or don't, that's less important than really understanding what that company does. Do you have an opinion on is it really excelling at what it does? Do you understand the balance sheet? Do you understand the income statement? Do you understand the cash flow statement? But most of all, do you understand the business model? And do you really think the business model has got legs? Does it, is it gonna be around for a while? That's where I like to look at. Before I look at any numbers, I wanna understand, do I like its products? Do I like where it's positioned? 
Do I think it's got a chance of growing, thriving? And then if I get through all of that, then I want to understand the numbers. But don't think you're you're a billion investor because the stock went up and you made money on it, or you're a lousy investor because it went the other way. You become a great investor by really understanding what makes these companies tick. It is not that hard. Most of it is logic unless you're investing in some bank, a commercial bank is a hard, it's a hard balance sheet and income statement to understand. But for the most part, the rest of it is really un, you can understand and you've got to make a determination whether you like the business model, you think they're doing well, where they stand in the competitive environment, and then look at the numbers. That's what we do. Do I like the products of the company that I'm about to invest in? Do I like what it's doing? Do I think it's got a business model that's going to be around for a while? Yeah, definitely. That's what I would urge all you people to do. Yeah. Looking at value is always good. Um, so we've reached the end of our prepared section. Now I'm going to hand it over to Ben, who will be going through um, some questions that the audience has submitted. Yeah, so um, I've been getting questions sent in throughout the presentation or the Q&A. Um, if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask, please send them to me in the chat now and we'll get around to them later. But um, speaking of valuations, uh, what is your view on the current market and the valuations? Well, you know, up until recently, you've had two markets. You've had a regular market and then you've had you know the the internet companies that have that are dancing to a different drummer, and they and and rightfully so. On one hand, they've done a phenomenal job. They grow beautifully, seem to generate a lot of cash. On the other hand, I think some of them have overstepped their bounds, and I'm not going to get into names. But I think you've got to understand that they have, some of them are going to have to be dealing with governments both here and overseas. And some of that may take the wind out of some of their sails. And okay. so I, I don't, you know, I don't really understand some of the the challenges that are facing some of these companies, even though they're doing a great job and they are doing a great job. There's no question about it. I like my kind of companies better. I understand them. I can relate to them. And, and uh, look, I mean, I have the utmost respect for Amazon. But, you know, at a certain point in time, you cannot have 100% market share. Governments are not going to stand for that. And but I think those are some of the watch outs that I would, I would look at. But the market is today priced, unfortunately, based on interest rates. And interest rates for the first time, and people were saying they were going to go up in 2010, 11, and 12, and they said that every year and they didn't. Well, now they're finally starting to go up a bit. And if they do go up a bit, that changes the dynamics of the stock market because the dividends, the yields on many of these companies change when you look at it by comparison to where you could put your money in a bank, whether you could buy debt and so forth. Right now, I mean, if you own P&G, you get a, don't hold me to it, a 2.5% dividend. And if you bought the stock way back when, it's a 5% you know, yield on a stock. It's way better than you get on your money anywhere else. 
and your money is safe as houses there. But if interest rates continue to climb, you won't be looking at P&G so much for the dividend. And I think that that's going to have a negative impact on, on the on, and it already has as the interest rates have picked up a very small amount. I don't believe interest rates are going to go up a lot. I think the Fed is going to do whatever they can to keep them down. We don't need higher interest rates. We don't need all this inflation either, but which we're going to get because the government is just giving out huge amounts of money, some of which I agree with and some of which I don't. It doesn't make a difference. They're doing it anyway. So I think you've got to be, I think you need to understand that we now have a potentially changing landscape in the market and a changing landscape that we haven't had in terms of interest rates and potential inflation, potential inflation in 10 plus years. So that's changing. COVID has put a new spin on everything. And what's interesting is the market rewarded the companies that were doing well through COVID. It stopped rewarding them and now it's rewarding the companies that are not doing well today but look like they've got a big bounce back coming when this COVID thing is under control. Okay. You can make so, your decisions from there. Yeah. So would you say that the, the process of investing, um, would you say that's more rewarding and exciting or would you say that you enjoy the result of um, your investments more? I, I enjoy the process. You know, I'm, we're a very long-term investor. You know, we're called the hedge fund, which is the furthest thing from the truth. Most recent fund we raised was a fund that's 10 years plus two one-year extensions. So, you know, my the first investment I ever made when we started this fund in 2005 is Wendy's, and I still have it. So <laughs> the turnover wasn't that great on that investment. So I, I think that... Uh, I enjoy, I enjoy the process and I enjoy the involvement with the company. I'm on the board of Wendy's. I don't agree with everything they do and they know it and I tell them and we have a nice discussion about it, but I have the utmost respect for management, the day-to-day management. And I think they're doing a great job, but I've got my opinions on certain things they're doing, and sometimes we'll agree, sometimes we won't. Yeah, obviously that's understandable. So I'm um, sorry, you got to speak up. I said obviously that's understandable. Um, so for um, since a lot of our audience is new investors, um, what would you say, or where where would you say you need to be financially in order to begin investing? I think you got to be near a Bloomberg terminal. I mean, <laughs> that's where you need to be. Uh, but seriously, you've got to you you've got to invest that which you can afford within reason to lose or lose part of it. Yeah, and that's very important. I mean, you know, investing and swinging to the fences. I think it's just a bad bet today, especially with the way the market, with the, always the way the markets move. Um, so I, I think that's important. All right. But um, I think I think you've got to buy companies that you truly understand, not because yeah. your buddy told you this stock is going to double in three days. Go buy it. You know, not because GameStop went up so much. Yeah. I mean, this GameStop right. thing is a silly. I haven't looked at GameStop in five or ten years, but it's the craziest thing I, I've I've seen. But uh, so you got to be careful of those things. 
Yeah. So with with companies like GameStop, which were being shorted because of um, the way they were ran and managed, what are some key aspects of failing companies or businesses that you see, and what's generally um, the issue? There are a lot of issues. I mean, you could, you could, it starts with management. Does the company have good management? And are they, are they working the business every single day and making the right decisions? That's, that's, the part, that's an important part of it. Do you think the product line, the business they're in, is relevant to today's world we live in? And as you look out, what, however you look at today's world, is it relevant to that? That's really important. You have got to be a very important, you are, you are the ultimate judge of saying yes or no to buying a stock. And you should not give up that, that right because somebody told you to buy something and they're a good friend. That's, that's not the way to do it. The way to do it is I believe is to read up on the company. You, you're, you're a good judgment. You're a good judge. Use your, look, I like to say, my brain is good, some, it's right sometimes or wrong other times, but my stomach is brilliant. And I follow that a lot when I don't is when I get into trouble. So I try to listen to my gut, but not before, after I've done my work and understand the business, where where it sits in the world, what sits vis-a-vis the competitors, what is the financial condition, and so forth. And those are things you guys can make. You can make those decisions yourself. You can have people help you. That's fine. But you really should be doing that, understanding what you're buying and why you're buying it. That's yeah. what I would do, and not because a broker tell you to, to buy it. Okay. Um, and so I think that wraps up. Um, we, there was a lot of longer questions, but we don't have time to get to them. I think that will wrap up our um, audience submitted Q&A. So I will pass it back off to Rahul to um, close us off. Yeah. Um, thank you to all the people who submitted questions. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get to all of them, but... Um, um, you'll definitely have your answers, um, answers sometime in the future. So um, just some um, housekeeping stuff, important links, right? So sign up to receive the weekly recap of the financial news, right? Um, what Justin said, you know, staying on top of things is really important. So if you want to keep in touch with all the latest financial news, make sure to subscribe to our newsletter. Um, our podcast also does the same thing, so that's the uh, We'll send all of these details, um, you know, in the email that's following this. So don't worry about you know taking note of all of this. Just be aware that all of these resources are provided by so that you guys can be sound investors. And uh, that about wraps our presentation up for today. Uh, yeah, so thank you. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Nelson once again. Thank you very much for joining us today a, a pleasure and thank you for having me appreciate it yeah, appreciate everything thank you bye-bye thank you all for have a good thank day you everyone for attending <laughs>